Nature's riches are often stored in impossible hiding places. Oil in the Beaufort Sea, diamonds in Siberia, and mountains of coal in northeastern British Columbia. This subarctic region in the Canadian Rockies contains enough thermal and metallurgical coal to last 300 years, a wealth of energy hidden in a remote hinterland. Drive north from Vancouver. Ten hours and you're in Prince George. Another 116 kilometers and you are at Anzac, B.C. The coal is still another 130 kilometers away through forbidding yet magnificent territory wild and unsettled. In winter, temperatures will drop to minus 30 degrees, cold enough to make rubber boots as brittle as glass. For the steel mills of Japan, BC coal offers a secure source of energy, but the deadline to begin delivering up to 9 million tons a year was just 33 months away. Only 995 days to plan, design and build a modern, efficient rail link from the mines to the BC rail main line at Toshida through some of the most formidable terrain and winter weather in Canada. The coal would have to be hauled from the Quintet and Bull Moose mines to a deep sea terminal at Prince Rupert for shipment to Japan. Could it be done? The odds were against it. But BC Rail measured the chances of success and decided that the rewards were too great to miss. The gamble had to be taken. The moment the decision was made, time began to slip away. Zero plus 995 days, and moving fast. The twin pressures of economics and time demanded radical innovations. Development of British Columbia's Northeast coal fields was the largest undertaking in the province's history to cost more than two and a half billion dollars, half a billion of which was to construct the Tumbler Ridge branch line. To build such a line from the loading points at Tumbler Ridge to Tashida meant a new railway through 130 kilometers of untraveled wilderness. Survey crews discovered one route through the Table and Wolverine Valleys that could bypass the areas of heaviest snowfall and ensure year-round passage of coal trains. Along the route, there would be four tunnels, one of them nine kilometers long, another six, plus 11 bridges and loading loops at both mine sites. In addition, the existing line from Toshida to Prince George would need to be upgraded to handle heavy coal trains. Without a costly tunnel ventilation system, multiple diesel-electric locomotives, drawing heavy trains, can overheat and stall in long tunnels for lack of air. So BC Rail was faced with a dilemma. The best route in terms of winter snow conditions called for two tunnels, so long they would have to be equipped with doors and an exhaust extraction system. In January 1982, it became clear that the added cost of ventilation would be better spent on electrification. Also, to encourage the use of renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuels, federal and provincial government funding was available to help offset the incremental cost of electrifying. Thanks to accelerated cooperation by both levels of government, funding was quickly approved, and the decision to electrify was announced in August 1982. Electric locomotives don't need oxygen for combustion, nor as much air for cooling. Through tunnels or open terrain, they depend only on a constant supply of electrical power. The W.A.C. Bennett Dam on the Peace River offered an endless supply of hydroelectricity. A 230 kilovolt transmission line from the dam ran within two kilometers of the railway. So the decision to electrify made even more sense. In fact, such an abundant source of power could handle a 50 kilovolt system rather than the conventional 25 kilovolts used by most electric railways. While the decision to electrify was being deliberated, work continued simultaneously on several fronts. Tunnel construction was well underway. Access roads had been built to the tunnel portals and camps had been set up to house thousands of workers all along the route.
tunneling went on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Broken rock or muck was pulled out and used for grade construction and roadbed material. Tunneling for the Tumbler Ridge Line was guided by the pinpoint accuracy of laser beams to ensure that tunnels drilled from opposite sides of a mountain would meet precisely in the middle. A moment of truth. Breakthrough was on schedule and in alignment to within five centimeters. To save precious time, two of the seven major bridges were pre-built on the riverbank, mounted on greased skids and then winched across the river to the other side. The original rail came in 12-meter lengths, which were then pre-welded into 24-meter sections and bolted into place for preliminary use. This method helped meet the construction deadline and also allowed the roadbed to settle properly before continuous welded rail was put down. First, it was necessary to design the system itself, then the method by which it was to be installed, and finally, the means by which it could be completed before a looming deadline. As soon as the first tracks were laid, other crews followed close behind erecting the masts that would carry the railway's electrical power supply. Made of lightweight steel and set in deep foundations, these galvanized pylons will need little maintenance and will last indefinitely. Insulators. A 50 kilovolt system needs insulators in large numbers and in several shapes. Made of porcelain and glazed with the same care as dinnerware, each insulator is sounded with a mallet.
perfect insulator emits a distinctive tone. They're then tested with a high voltage electric charge. If the charge goes through the porcelain, it's flawed and must be discarded. But if the high voltage charge is resisted and stays on the outside, the piece is passed as fit for service. In the field, special brackets support the insulators on the masts before the power transmission wires and support cables are installed. Combined, it's called a catenary system. And in this case, it was designed specifically to meet BC Rail's unique needs in the north. The catenary is built in sections, each with its own circuit breakers, so that trouble can be isolated to a single sector without damaging or shutting down the entire system. In everyone's mind was the knowledge that at 50,000 volts, the electrified tumbler line was a first for Canada. ASEA of Sweden acknowledged world leaders in 50 kilovolt technology and catenary design were consulted. Each component had to be capable of fail-safe operation in the harsh northern climate. Built-in safety factors were crucial, and the high standards demanded were a challenge to all who took part. Wire and cable had to meet rigid tests for strength and were wound onto reels under precise tension so that in the field they would unwind without distortion. The contact wire is shaped to fit inside clamps of cupro-nickel alloy. The design is Swedish, adapted to Canadian conditions. Contact wire is hard-drawn copper supported by a stranded copper messenger and a series of droppers. Tension of wire and cable is critical during installation and later when trains are operating. Sets of weights are used to maintain and adjust tension in each section of the catenary. Okay. At 50,000 volts, only one substation would be needed for the entire 130 kilometer line, compared with two or more that would have been necessary with a 25 kilovolt system. A 25 kilovolt system would have called for power transmission lines to be strung over the Rocky Mountains at prohibitive cost. Meanwhile, 5,000 kilometers away in London, Ontario, a group of specialists was assembled to build BC Rail's unique locomotives, a type that had never before been built or seen in Canada. 
To verify the design, a life-size mock-up of each main section was built before manufacturing began. The General Motors Diesel Division of London, the Electromotive Division of Chicago, and the ASEA Group of Sweden combined to develop the engineering design and production drawings necessary to build this new generation of locomotives, with time pressures becoming increasingly urgent. Called General Motors GF6C locomotives, they're the first of a new breed. They use standard components wherever possible to control both purchase and maintenance costs but many features were custom designed for sub-Arctic coal hauling duty. The GF6C must be a locomotive for heavy work in all weather. When there are repairs to be made, they'll be made in a remote corner of British Columbia. Many individual wires and terminals were used because they're more easily traceable and replaceable. In other words, field fixable. This characteristic of the GF6C is seen in the massive circuitry, carefully preassembled according to plans that are unique to this powerful locomotive. Wiring complete, the spaghetti-like nerve system or harness of the locomotive is pulled off the pattern board and lifted into the main control cabinet. When tested and installed, this control cabinet will form the back of the engineer's cab in the locomotive, convenient and accessible. But first, the bed plate. This is the backbone of the locomotive, the foundation on which all other components will be assembled. It's made of solid steel, 50 millimeters thick, partly for rigidity, but also to provide much of the weight required for good traction. When the underrigging is in place, the entire unit is turned over for installation of interior components. to develop the tractive effort needed to haul 13,000 trailing tons up BC Rail's 1.2% ruling grade, six of these GM E88 traction motors are used in each locomotive. There is one motor per axle to develop a total of 6,000 horsepower, a primary consideration when climbing from Tumbler Ridge to the summit tunnels. While all seven electric locomotives are custom designed, Number 6001 was specially modified with sensing devices in these red traction motors to monitor the new designs under actual working conditions. One of the new motors was torture tested far beyond the limits it would ever see in the field. Like muscles stretched past endurance when striving for a record. wheel slippage within allowable limits, an advanced radar-based wheel slip system computes the variation between rail speed and wheel rotation speed at each axle, governing the power output accordingly. Electric sensors detect all current differentials among the axles. These differences are a sure sign of slippage, and the system compensates to restore maximum traction. Operators of these locomotives are able literally to smell trouble before it becomes serious. Overheating roller suspension bearings and journals cause these odor bombs to emit the unmistakable stench of rotten eggs. No one could ignore it. With the diesel equivalent of 6,000 horsepower, the electric locomotives can handle heavier loads and steeper grades at improved operating speeds. One electric locomotive can develop the power of two conventional diesel electric units, which permits hauling up grades at continuous speeds to 35 kilometers per hour. Electric locomotives have significantly better track adhesion because power can be applied evenly and gradually. They give double the service life, 
one-third the maintenance cost and have only one-third the downtime. Energy savings are promised as a bonus. All operating systems are enclosed within the full width body of the locomotives. Field inspections and maintenance can therefore be carried out inside, regardless of weather. Ease of access inside was emphasized throughout the design, but access to the roof was made almost impossible. The smooth sides of the locomotives were designed to minimize the risk of anyone being electrocuted by the 50,000 volts overhead. The pantograph is the first link in the locomotive's power supply. It receives the 50,000 volts of single phase alternating current by constant contact with the overhead catenary system. A thyristor unit converts a portion of this power from alternating current to the direct current used by the E88 traction motors. The process gives the engineman fingertip notchless control over the amount of power going to the motors. Each locomotive has two pantographs, either of which can be used to power the unit. Pressure of the pantograph against the conducting wire is critical. If there's too much pressure, there'll be excessive wear on the contact surfaces. If there's insufficient pressure, there will be arcing and interrupted power supply. A lightly balanced pneumatic system is used to maintain proper and consistent pressure. The first locomotive, number 6001, receives the finishing strokes of the spray gun. Sporting special new colors, she was soon ready for delivery with a 400,000 kilometer warranty. From London, she began her 5,000 kilometer journey across Canada as dead-hauled freight on CP Rail. The first of seven powerful new workhorses, she was to begin a life of almost constant labor in a landscape of grandeur but harsh reality. The forward reverse control movements are similar to those of diesel locomotives, and operators can convert from one type of unit to the other, transferring their skills with confidence, regardless of the source of power. The control consoles are user-friendly, the result of weeks of collaboration between designers and operators. A single lever controls both the pulling power and dynamic braking. During dynamic braking, the locomotive's traction motors operate as generators, producing power instead of consuming it. This extra power is fed through 11 converters, changing it into a form which can be used by the brake resistor grids. These grids then convert the power into heat, which is dissipated through rooftop vents. Under heavy braking, air leaving the vents can reach 700 degrees Fahrenheit. To avoid premature wear on the pantograph, the conducting wire in the catenary is staggered so that it sweeps across the pantograph from side to side, like the shuttle on a loom. For months, a test car was attached to 6001 to gauge her performance. The drawbar pull test demonstrated that she could crest a 1.2% grade at a minimum of 35 kilometers per hour hauling her share of a 13,000 ton gross load. On the other hand, braking effort tests proved that she could stop the train while heading down a 1.5% grade with the same load. 6001 came through with honors and was soon joined by her six stablemates, some of them bearing slight modifications, refinements on an already proven design. This technology, new to Canada, and especially to sub-Arctic operations, is an unqualified success. All seven 6,000 horsepower locomotives are in service on the Tumbler Ridge Line. They haul 98-car unit trains, each about two kilometers long, with a coal-carrying capacity of 10,000 tons. The unit trains remain intact from mine to port and back again. 
with little or no pause between trips. The loadout loops at the mines are long enough to accommodate two 98-car trains so that one on the move won't be held up by one in the loading process, and each of the two mines has its own loadout configuration. The electric motive power is exchanged for diesel electric power at Toshida Junction, and loaded coal trains continue from there to the port of Prince Rupert. The electric locomotives return to Tumbler Ridge with the empties to load and maintain the demanding cycle. But they're observed mainly by elk and owl. Four electric locomotives haul the loaded unit trains, while two others serve the mine loadouts. The remaining locomotive is a spare to allow for scheduled maintenance or repair. Test runs have been made successfully using only three units to a loaded train and only two to backhaul empties. The special coal cars are equipped with Dressler radial self-steering trucks. They were purchased on a cost-sharing basis with Canadian National Railway, which built them in its shops at Transcona, Manitoba. Rotary couplers speed dumping at the Ridley Island Terminal in Prince Rupert. Time-consuming coupling and uncoupling are eliminated. BC Rail is a leader in the use of microwave communication systems for strung-out routes through rugged terrain. With its long reach and multiple use capability, Microwave permits instant voice and simultaneous data transmissions in weather that could knock out conventional lines. Microwave communication is ideal for train control in the wilderness. The 130-kilometer line is now a hard-working reality. It was a calculated risk that has given Canada one of the world's most advanced railways, tapping energy resources the world needs while using renewable energy to carry the coal to market. It was a once-in-a-century opportunity.